I'm Darrell Owens. Welcome to a world of difference. Music, the proverb goes, has charms to soothe a savage breast. But for children who learn differently, when it comes to learning to play an instrument, research shows that music potentially can yield greater benefits. For these kids, taking up an instrument can help them better engage with the world, boost confidence, and sharpen cognitive functioning. For parents looking to unlock their different learners' potential, that's music to their ears. On this episode, you'll meet two young men separated by nearly 8,000 miles in a language barrier who are singing a similar song of developmental success thanks to taking up a musical instrument. Next, our Ask the Experts panel will discuss the challenges and benefits musical instruments hold for children who learn differently. Later, we'll introduce you to our latest difference maker, a musician, producer, educator, and entrepreneur who channeled an ADHD diagnosis into a Grammy-winning jazz career. But first, at first blush, a pair of teens who respectively call Houston, Texas, and China home may seem to have little in common. Yet, their shared passion for jamming on their chosen instruments is a common thread that has both hitting high notes in their life journeys. Senior correspondent Cindy Peterson brings us the story. The saying that music is a universal language holds true for neurodiverse individuals, often bridging a barrier that overlooks their learning differences. In Houston, Texas, 13-year-old Solomon Levine has found that his love of playing drums has helped him focus and manage his ADD. I asked my mother, hey, uh, what about, um, what about drums? Mm. I want to try drums. So it was on my birthday and she got me a little, uh, little drum lesson and I thought it went great. And I learned a lot and I realized that music is actually really fun. And then I expanded from there to playing bass guitar. And recently I just restarted guitar. And I realized that now that I've started a new chapter in music, I can actually expand and play more. With a learning difference comes anxiety, a lot of it. And um, when, uh, when I would uh, just have anxiety, I would, just shut everybody in my brain, go to my studio, and just play all of my anxiousness. Like just, it's gone because I'm just like in this new void with nothing but me and my instruments. After his parents had tried everything in the book to help their son, they became very thankful for the loud beating of the drums when Solomon was practicing. We got to music because we tried lots of other things. Um, you know, we, we tried various sports, we tried the Taekwondo, we tried, we kept trying to find the outlet. I, I kind of felt like running was going to be a great thing, except for he had no interest in running. Um, this drumming thing happened, um, he asked for it, I was willing to try anything. It almost provides like a therapeutic zen for him. Solomon started a band with his friends and recently put on a benefit concert to provide a local school with a Nook Pod, a special noise canceling pod that helps kids with learning difficulties. This project was his way of giving back to schools who didn't have the resources to help kids like himself with learning differences. In the band, it is me, my friend George, who is on guitar, mm -hmm. my other friend Lucas, who does vocals and guitar, my other friend Ryder, who does bass guitar our little program we called called mitzvah city limits now this was the um this was the show that we put on uh to uh we were benefiting the school called addicts middle school in uh hisd houston isd and um they had a bunch of kids with um learning differences that didn't really have all the tools that my school had and uh, we raised about $6,000, which was really exciting. Yeah. Uh, our show went on for like four hours, and by then we had enough money to buy something called a Nook Pod, which is something my school uses, and you can do work, and it's noise canceling, and it has light in it, but you can get your work done without multiple distractions, and it's 
by the way, very comfy too. I am so proud of my son for choosing this because that wasn't even what I had come up with. So I was really proud of him. Now let's go across the globe to mainland China and meet 18-year-old Jia Jin Chen. Jia Jin is autistic and has a difficult time communicating, but not when it comes to music. His award-winning classical performances have moved audiences since he first learned at the age of seven. My name is Chen Jia Jin. I'm 18 years old. I've been learning piano for 11 years. Yeah, I'm from China, Henan province. I started to play piano when I was seven years old. That was in 2009. Um, because I love music and my mom being very supportive towards my music career development. So she sent me on to learning piano. After struggling in school with behavioral issues, his mother chose to try him on the piano and his musical talents began to blossom. I chose the piano as an instrument for judging because when he was a child, when he was at school, and it's hard for him to concentrate, and he would run around in the classroom, and then she thought the best instrument and to develop the brain and and also the concentration and is the piano. So I chose piano as an instrument for judging. Jia Jin's piano teacher has worked with him meticulously on technique, fostering his natural gift of music. First of all, um, Jia Jin really loves music, but like many other children at the beginning, he was not able to just repeat you know, the same thing. And uh, um, he also was quite emotional when he met uh, some issues like technical issues. but. Uh, under um, my supervision and also the encouragement, I'm judging now could sit down and repeat the techniques, you know, and to practice repeat the techniques and all the time. And, and also he's very talented. So I work very hard on practice. So I learned the technical skills from my teacher and uh, for most of the time, I could sit in front of the piano for many hours just to practice. Um, I also want to use my music to help other autistic children and also for them to feel the love from the world and also have communication through my music with the world. Jia Jin's mother is amazed at the growth she has seen in him and his love for the piano. He has become an inspiration all over the world. When he was very young, he likes to listen to music um, as his mother, and I want him to do what he really likes. So I do my best to support him to do what he really enjoys. And of course, when he was a young boy, and because uh, of, you know, um, he has autistic issues and it was not easy and for me to manage him. But uh, again, and what is the most important thing for me and is to support him to do what he really likes. And so over these years, and uh, I really found his teachers are being so patient and loving to him. That's how he has developed. So I want to thank to all the people who helped judge him. I really appreciate that. And I also appreciate this interview and from you guys and to support judging to love his music. With a world of difference, I'm Cindy Peterson. Thanks, Cindy. If Solomon and Gia Jun's experiences strike a chord, now is a good time to turn to the experts to explore how children with learning disabilities can benefit from playing an instrument. Frank Fitzpatrick is a Grammy-nominated multi-platinum music producer. He serves on the faculty of Singularity University's Exponential Medicine and is a contributor for Forbes, writing about the intersection of music, health, and human potential. 
Fitzpatrick is also the author of the book, Amplified, Unleash Your Potential Through the Power of Music. Dr. Alice N. Hamill is a widely known music educator who currently teaches for James Madison and Virginia Commonwealth Universities. She's a music intervention specialist for ASSET, Autism, Support, Education, and Training. Hamill is a member of the Kennedy Center National Forum, examining the intersection of arts education and special education. She is also chair of the National Association for Music Education Task Force on Students with Special Needs. So let's start with Dr. Hamill. What does the research say about the value of playing musical instruments for children who are neurodiverse? The research is very interesting. Um, first, of course, it's important for every student to be involved in music, every student to learn an instrument. Um, however, what we found is it's even more important for students with learning disabilities, developmental disabilities, differences, um, to be involved with music. Uh, we found in research that the brains of students um, with, say, you know, autism, ADHD, other types of learning differences um, are literally hardwired differently in the factory when the brain is put together. And that they can often learn things through music better, more easily, and more completely than without music. So yes, it's critically important. Thank you, Dr. Hamill. The next question is to you, Frank. Um, in what specific ways can playing a musical instrument help improve uh, learning for these students? Well, there's a number of ways, Daryl, and I want to uh, reflect on Dr. Hamill. It's true. You know, we talk about when we bring music into kids. It's that, you know, especially in these days, every kid is at risk in some regards and has some challenges. So. And music has this capacity to activate all these different areas of the brain simultaneously, unlike other stimuli. So regardless of their learning ability um, or where they are in dealing with stress and personal levels, um, music can help to create neural pathways, help to bridge those um, some of those synapse gaps. You know, and but in terms of benefits um, in, in learning, there's very you know a, a lot to, a lot to mention. So I, I go through a much bigger list in my book, but. Um, amplify, but we can talk about building self-confidence, uh, um, stimulating imagination, cr cultivating creativity, strengthening hand-eye, spatial coordination, better listening skills, um, better language acquisition ability, um, enhanced memory, self-discipline, focus. We could go on and on. So uh, it's just that the numbers, it's like, what doesn't it help with? <laughs> it's probably a bigger question, right? Thanks, Frank. That's quite a list there. Dr. Hamill, uh, my next question to you is, um, how might playing a musical instrument benefit a child whose learning differences uh, impairs their ability to uh, communicate uh, verbally or emotionally with the world? I think it's kind of a game changer for a lot of students to have a way they can communicate their feelings. They can also communicate what they know and what they understand through music, through their instrument, ways that they couldn't really communicate otherwise. Um, also being in an ensemble, being with other students um, is a very collaborative experience. And unfortunately in our schools today, many students don't really have a lot of opportunities to share and to collaborate and to be with others and to feel that feeling of community. And participation in music does that for students. So I think, you know, it, that social experience, the emotional, you know, social emotional learning that happens with it, um, as well as the academic gains that can be made and the musical knowledge and all of it working together. Thank you, Dr. Hamill. So Frank, uh, playing a musical instrument is kind of a sensory smorgasbord for uh, the person who's playing the, the instrument. Um, how might playing the instrument and engaging the senses in this way help a child who has learning differences? Well, well again, it's many ways, and it's a great question, Daryl, and, and reflecting upon what Dr. Hamill said. So, um, Different people, different children learn in different through different ways. Some are more, as you know, Dr. Hamill could support auditory. Some learn with more sensory touch. Some kids are more visual. Music allows us to let them explore across those different areas in in one diff, in one complete kind of um, experience and to see what shows up for them. So it's a great way to kind of bring those strengths out and see which ones they tend to lean on. 
Um, also, in terms of you know sensory and emotions and physicality, emotions take place in the body more or less, and and playing an instrument or singing combines both the the sensory part, but also the physicality of movement and and breath and oxygen flow. So it can again really help in a number of different other areas of um, regulating emotions and and expressing emotions, as, as Dr. Hamill mentioned, and so. It's uh, the sensory part and the physical, tangible part mixed with the, the, the um, cognitive part is very important. All right. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Dr. Hamill, I want to circle back on something uh, Frank was uh, mentioning earlier about how music can help with self-esteem and self-confidence. Can you drill down a little bit for me and tell me exactly how that happens and what benefits the kid gets from this? Oh, absolutely. If you have a learning disability, right, a difference, if you're neurodiverse in schools, um, you're often left out or chosen last or just not picked at all to be in groups or with, with others in a class. Um, so you go to music, which is something that can be the thing for a student, then all of a sudden you can be seen by your peers in a more positive light, in a more productive light. You know, they can say, oh, yeah, but Alice plays the flute and she's, she's really good at that. Um, so it kind of gives that student that social cachet that, that they need, the place where they feel they belong and where students can see them in a positive light and of someone as someone who is really doing well. All right, well, thank you. Uh, Frank, here's a question for you that I think um, probably um, dives into your book a little bit. Um, what are some of the misconceptions about the way we currently teach music that can be undermining to the well-being and self-esteem of a child? Well, Daryl, it's, it's a great question, and it's one that often gets left out of the conversation. Um, you know, it's, and it's something I'm very, very passionate about, you know, for centuries we've been teaching kids how to learn kids adults everybody how to learn music primarily for two reasons and one is um performance so they can become performers like uh, dr hamill's sister is i think the, one of the lead flautists in the detroit symphony so she was on a performance track but that's not where every kid needs to go and it's not the purpose necessarily in music that's just one track you know and so if we can and sometimes since we frame our education around the performance track or our kids learn from the social society about becoming music as a way to become famous or, you know, to become rich or whatever they, you know, they have these two pathways. And if they see themselves as not capable enough to reach those pathways or they're not testing well to get there, then they're going to actually lose self-esteem. They're actually going to have a completely different develop with this the opposite of what you want them to do by learning music. So ideally, you know, you want them to experience the learning of music without the pressure of performance. So they can experience how they can use music as a resource when they need it for times that they're stressed or times that they need to regulate, self-regulate. And, and kids are very good at doing that with music provided that they're not expected to be something other than themselves. And they're, since they're already, they already are quite gifted. Well, Frank, a quick follow-up on that. Uh, how can parents make sure that they don't cross the line into going into that uh, red line territory? I mean, because our world, unfortunately, is filled with uh, stage moms and dads, and um, sometimes they might not understand that second track that you were talking about. Well, just to be aware of um, what every parent ultimately wants the same for their kids. So they also see those paths of being a performer or being, you know, famous or whatever it is as a beneficial thing. But ultimately what they really want is the well being and happiness of their child. And as I mentioned and go through in, in my book and all the literature really covers is it's such a pathway for them to develop their identity, for them to develop, you know, relationships as Dr. Hamill re referred to, you know, when they do things together musically. And even if they don't Play, can't play an instrument and they can you know they can sing there's many things they can do to connect with music as well as learning how to listen to music in a in a conscious way that they can adapt to use them and there's been studies done with that by associates of mine that, that they can teach kids as young as five years old and you know poor kids in the south side of chicago how to be consciously apply music in any area of their life where they need support whether it's learning or um you know 
anxiety or, or loneliness or these different areas. So, Watch the full Ask the Experts segment on our website at awodtv.org if you want to learn more about helping your child take up an instrument. You can also watch or listen on Facebook, YouTube, or on your favorite podcasting platform. For Ulysses Owens Jr., the three R's was often accompanied by a backbeat as he passed time in class treating his desk as a drum kit. He was later diagnosed with ADHD, but the little drummer boy parlayed his bar rump -a thump thump into becoming the first African-American drummer admitted into the Juilliard School and later into a Grammy award-winning jazz career. Not that Owens has forgotten his struggles, which led him to create a safe haven in his hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, where struggling kids can find their rhythm. Special correspondent Dave Dijon has the story. Ulysses Owens Jr. He's an educator, philanthropist, author, and producer. He's also a two-time Grammy Award-winning drummer. With so many accolades, you might be surprised to know that learning didn't come easy for young Ulysses. And his grammar school teachers knew right away that something wasn't quite right. I had a teacher, she's really amazing, Mrs. Cole, and uh, she would be teaching. And you know me, man, while she's teaching, I'd be just beating on the desk, you know, just going. And she's like, Ulysses, can you please stop? And I'm like, okay, okay. And I go back. And then if I wasn't beating on the desk, I'm a chronic daydreamer. And so uh, she'd always say, you know, well, you know, what's the issue here? And so, you know, of course, I went and talked to my parents, and uh, we understood that, you know, I had uh, ADHD, you know, and even my, my father uh, doesn't admit to it, but I think I got it from him because <laughs> we both can't sit still, you know, too long. Ulysses says what really helped was that his parents and teachers didn't describe his learning disability as a challenge or something bad. Instead, they simply said, they were just saying, hey, here's something that you're gonna have to overcome, or here's something you're gonna have to learn how to manage. And so what my parents did, they said, okay, we'll make deals with you. If you can sit still, or if you can do this, then we'll let you play the drums. Or if you can do that, then we'll let you do this, you know? So that was kind of the first sort of issue I had. Um, and even now, as an adult, and learn, having been, you know, fortunately successful, I still have ADHD. Like, in my, the thing that I have now is I have to always be busy. I have to always be moving. So that was kind of the first challenge, and then I was say the second major challenge was really like some cognitive uh, issues that I started having, particularly around the subjects of like math. Um, it was something about like numbers, like when it got too convoluted, like around like fractions or other things, it just, my mind couldn't really decipher it. So I actually went to Sylvan Learning Center and they did some really great testing and they started realizing like that I had to kind of see things more like broken down. So they started taking like really big math equations and they started using like, like blocks or color coded items and saying, okay, Ulysses, this represents a fraction or this represents that. And so I started understanding how my mind works and I'm very visual. So if I could see it in like a logical way and like it, then it would make sense and I could kind of nag it, like navigate like all the difficult stuff. And navigate he did. Ulysses not only graduated from high school, but he also received a full scholarship to Juilliard School in New York. So when I found out that I got in, I, it was history on many levels. I was the first uh, instrumental student at my, at my uh, high school, Douglas Anderson, to get in. Uh, I was also the first African-American to get in. And then even at Juilliard, I was the first African-American drummer to ever enter the school. Getting into Juilliard School was one thing, but being able to graduate was quite another. Ulysses says his ADHD made it difficult to wrap his head around some of the tough assignments he was given. My prof uh, professor and advisor, she said, Ulysses, I think you should go get some testing. And again, that whole sort of cognitive uh, thing of like not being able to look at like uh, calculative problems or numbers that came back up. And so they started saying, okay, how can we take shapes? How can we take bigger images and let them represent 
different movements or different intervals or different things happening in music. And then the other thing I had to learn was that I had to go at things slower, which was hard because as a musician, I process really fast. So I had to realize if I'm dealing with mathematic equations or I'm studying something really uh, intricate, I can't try to like whiz past it. Today, when Ulysses isn't performing in New York City, he devotes his time to an organization called Don't Miss a Beat. It's a nonprofit Ulysses founded in his hometown of Jacksonville. To break that down very simply, we are a safe haven for children to come from the ages of five to 16 years old, and they can find their rhythm with us. They're gonna get you know, academic homework assistance every day. Uh, then they get free arts instruction in the area of music, dance, and drama, and yoga. And then we have a really great summer camp, uh, arts intensive, where they get to put on a production, a Broadway junior production every year. I am not a statistic. I will achieve only great things. I am just as good as anyone else. I can do anything I set my mind to. This is the pledge that inspires success at Don't Miss a Beat. It's also Ulysses' mantra, inspiring him to get through some of the tough times. You have to make a kid feel like they're winning at something. So if they're failing at this or they're having challenges at that, they can't, they can't be surrounded by that. So, you know, they always say there's a couple basic functionalities that people need. We need to feel like we belong. We need to feel like we're loved. We need to feel like we're understood. And we need to feel heard and we need to feel seen. So if you're gonna get those things from various things, so maybe you're seen by a gang, maybe you're seen by somebody who gets you into trouble, or maybe you're seen by your parent, or you're seen by a really great teacher, but you still need to be seen, right? And so to me, part of getting a kid to either go stay on this side of the track or not cross the negative side, is you need to give them those basic functionalities. Because if you don't give them, I always say to my parents, like, you know, when they say, oh, you know, we love Don't Miss a Beat, but we can't, you know, we can't have them here this semester. Okay, great, but just know if you don't have them here, they're going to be into something else. For Ulysses, he doesn't miss a beat. He turned a challenge into his life's dream, and he's passing down wisdom to help future generations reach their potential. Reporting for A World of Difference, I'm Dave DeJohn. Thanks, Dave, and congratulations, Ulysses, for making a difference. And gotta say, I love the last name. And that does it for this edition of A World of Difference. I'm Daryl Owens. I'll see you back here next time. You can watch episodes of A World of Difference on the Beacon College Facebook and YouTube channels and on the show's website, awodtv.org. The website also provides tip sheets and other resources for your parenting journey. And you can listen to the show on the go on Spotify, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and other popular podcasting platforms. Thank you for watching and supporting A World of Difference.